Rebecca is the senior curator of the show that um, is just put up, which I'm actually gonna talk about. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> That's great. Ali Esmail, who's uh, my sister from Wellesley and Jed, hi. <laughs> this is great. And we're also now live streaming on YouTube. Oh, thank you, Emily, for putting that in the chat. All right, so I think we're ready to get started and people can keep pouring on in. So hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for the second episode of Beyond the War. Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation and Code Pink are hosting the series. My name is Arwa, I volunteer with Yemen and Relief, Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation, an organization that provides relief in Yemen and advocates in the US to end the war. And my name is Danica. I'm a Yemen campaigner at Code Pink. Code Pink has been working in coalition with other organizations to stop US involvement in the war in Yemen for years. And we always love working with Yemen Relief and Reconstruction Foundation. As many of you may know, Yemen is experiencing the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. This is a crucial issue that needs to be addressed. However, Yemen also has a rich history and culture that deserves attention. The Beyond the War series aims to showcase Yemen outside the context of war and center Yemeni voices. We hope to break stereotypes and build solidarity with Yemeni communities. Today, we have Alia Ali with us to discuss her mixed media installation of Najam Al Ahmar, The Red Star, and her film Mahjar. Alia is a Yemeni Bosnian US multimedia artist. Her work reflects on the politics of contested notions of linguistics, identity, borders, universality, colonization, mental slash physical confinement, and the inherent dualism that exists in each of them. For further information, please refer to her website and Instagram account, which are both in the chat. Without further ado, Alia, take it away. Thank you so much and um, salam alaikum to everyone. Um, and thank you so much, both of you for organizing this. I love this because Danica is Bosnian, Arwa is Yemeni. And so together we sort of are covering <laughs> each other's identities. Um, I'm gonna do a brief presentation of about 20 minutes. I wanna thank everybody who was able to join this evening. Um, do in the process, in order to keep it a little bit short, I'll keep a lot of ideas open um, in hope that there can be a discussion with conversation afterward. All right, let's. <clears throat> um, so I'd like to first of all talk a little bit about the project um, before going into Mahjar, as Arwa had mentioned, and the Red Star and Najm al Ahmar. There, um, there, there's a, there's a story behind that that kind of leads up to this. And I'd like to start with Borderland. So what you're seeing in front of you are um, images from this series. They are from my mother and my grandmother's collection. My mother who's Bosnian, but my grandmother who's Yemeni from their collection of dresses from different parts of Yemen. Um, this project initially started in 2016. Um, it was actually a project of resistance. It was during the, um, 
I guess the primaries, I should say throughout that year, the primaries of the last elections um, between Trump and Clinton. And as I found that there was a lot of bigotry that was coming out, not only against Arabs, Muslims, Yemenis, but a host of anybody who was not white, male, and privileged in some form, um, and straight. Um, I, I started from this notion of when I was looking at how Yemen was seen from afar, I realized that in Google, for example, when looking at it, Yemen was very much seen as the poorest nation in um, the Arab world in West Asia and North Africa. Um, during this time, the war had already begun. So it really Yemenis, we were seen for through our suffering. Uh, the images were the same sort of colors that were coming out of Iraq, out of Syria, um, and even Palestine, this sort of erasure that was happening of our colors, of our heritage, and, um, and of our culture. And I really, it kind of moved me to kind of, to think about the fact that I didn't really see my culture as such. I saw it as an explosion of color and it was something that I wanted to communicate and it came down to language. So I'm also the child of two linguists, two migrant linguists. And growing up, I always really saw how language was used um, to really manipulate depending on whose agenda it was that, the, that it was being translated for or by. And in this case, and particularly for, and in this case, when I think about Yemen, Yemen is an oral, um, oral history, has a oral history. It's an oral culture. Um, in fact, any Arab, um, if one considers themselves an Arab, that means that they had come from one of the seven tribes that came from Yemen. We're the most ancient civilization according to these lineages. Um, and so to think about how our history and how our stories were kept, I turned to the textiles. Because we were oral, uh, an oral history, many of the people in Yemen are actually illiterate. Um, and for that reason, it still does not mean though that we did not share and we didn't document. So a good example is my grandmother who was illiterate in reading and writing, but as you can tell, was very literate in motif. So what you're looking at right here is a citata. What you're also looking at is a documentation of the traders and travelers that Yemenis You see patterns that come from the Himalayas, from India, from as far as China, from Indonesia, and from Zanzibar. So essentially, not only is it a document of the trade exchange between these different nations, it is also a mapping. And it's something that's worn by Sana'ani women, women from Sana'a, um, and it's called the sitara. It's not only worn, but it's also used. So this is so I, this is just a way to say that um, not only is it something functional as a textile, but it's also a language in which we communicate and which we describe ourselves. This project ended up really kind of interest made me interested in seeing how other indigenous communities in different parts of the world who also came from oral histories communicated and who were essentially marginalized by the colonial powers that took over their nations um, and who ended up telling their narratives in stories that weren't theirs um, in languages that weren't theirs and and really to people who so who to people who weren't from the area so here what you see on um, the left is from Oaxaca, Mexico, what is considered Mexico, although it's, um, and it might be familiar because it's really drawing on images of Frida Kahlo. On the other side is from Rajasthan, India. This one is as well. And so I started seeing these really similar symbols that were coming back, not only in terms of really thinking about the beauty in which these cultures, including mine, had to offer, um, but also how misunderstood. These are images of ikat, so also again, kind of perhaps going back to both Muslim and Jewish traditions. Another two factors that really that I strongly believe have created a divisiveness and a division um, between societies, for example, like Uzbekistan and in Yemen. Here's, and we come back to Yemen. Um, and so with all of these series, I was able, with all of these images, in fact, I, um, and for different parts of the world, I went to 11 different regions, worked with masters over five to six weeks each in order to understand what was the process that they made, how did they make the textiles, what was the meaning, and was really not so surprised to, under, to see that we actually, there was so, there was a whole language of sort of indigenous, um, 
identity and sort of uh, unity that happened across these textiles. And through this entire body of work are 172 photographs, um, which essentially none of them are titled because I didn't feel like it was appropriate to title them as I would be enacting the same sort of colonial violence that others were by listing it in names that were either not in their language in Arabic or in Roman script in English. Um, and therefore the names and every all the information that they have is actually embedded directly in the textiles. And it's not by seeing their faces um, and revealing their faces as many documentary photographers have done such as Steve McCurry and so on, who have parachuted in and simply photographed and essentially enacted these violent words of photography such as to capture a culture, to capture an individual or to do a shoot, like to photo shoot. I really wanted to, um, sort of subvert that action and make these photo photographs as a collaboration with these different masters. The only difference was in Yemen because I couldn't go back to Yemen. And so um, for now, this is actually an image from Indonesia, which is actually a Hadrami, um, which is a Yemeni as part of Yemen. Um, it was a Hadrami merchant who had traded it with the Sultan in Java. So, um, so this was the beginning of it. Um, here we have some more ecots. And so eventually this project as, as large as it became really sort of became rather than became both a form of resistance um, to the to this sort of a violence that the media and that politicians continue to enact on creating this um, sort of horrific profile and also this continued orientalization of people um, in West Asia, even by enacting the word Middle East and really kind of coupling all of us into the same sort of type or nation. Um, but it was a way of really identifying our individuality. And I think going to where we are right now in terms of the crisis in Yemen, where in March 19th, we will be entering the seventh year of, um, of the war, and which is still considered one of the worst human, if not the worst humanitarian crisis. One, it makes me wonder that the reason that so many people have really choose to maybe disregard it is one, while we have our own problems, I mean, different problems within different nations, it's also perhaps that many people don't know what's at stake because of this sort of active um, erasure that has happened through the media. Um, and so when many people see these images, they're quite surprised because they can't imagine that Yemen could produce uh, something so beautiful because what they envision are uh, starving children rather than the beauty of what our imagination and what our hands can produce. Um, and so what happens when, if I, if I were to make this argument that um, culture to me is a tapestry and it is, um, reflected in the textiles and is told through these oral histories, then what happens when that erasure is going on? Um, so the next series is that I would like to talk about is Under Thread, also playing on this idea of under threat. Um, and uh, it's about two years ago, in fact, in 2018, I decided to go back to graduate school, not because, um, and to do my master's of fine arts, not because I thought that I needed it in order to become a successful artist and should anyone out there be there, be in that situation, um, I suggest you think about it for in a different purposes. For me, I went because I really needed assistance in how to talk about the war in Yemen. Um, and I found that something that was so close and so dear to me can some one can somehow get trapped in it without having a more critical or several critical eyes and mentors to assist in the in in the ideas around it. And of course, a lot about my work is about producing um, beautiful imagery and beautiful um, creating beauty in order to sort of attract the viewer and then to be able to <coughs> discuss and talk about very difficult, intimate topics. Um, well, this one was certainly difficult and intimate for me. And it was it was really a different step because I had no, you know, you can't, I didn't want to beautify this. I didn't want to beautify war, but at the same time, I also did not want to continue uh, communicating and spreading information that many, many of which were um, perhaps false, questionable, or quite limited, depending on which news media was reporting on it and what language it was and so on and so forth. And so what you see in front of you is my studio in 2018. 
um, at the California Institute of the Arts where I essentially started to research. Um, I should say that my undergraduate is in political science uh, from Wellesley College, uh, very much like Danica and Arwa who also worked with internet, who are also in international relations. And I think that really informed a lot of my practice. And this is where I sort of went in to dig, to, un to try to understand what and why and who, um, why was this happening? And so this in my studio, I essentially was um, compiling, you know, lists, uh, lists of lobbyists, lists of victims, lists of weapons manufacturing companies, um, and then timelines and looking at different forms of timelines, different languages, different countries, people who were involved. Um, and essentially, eventually it all somehow had to compile into one thing. And what I realized was after looking at the names of victims, particularly, I focused around um, uh, the massacre, the Lahyan massacre in, um, that was on August 9th, 2018, right before I started the school, um, my MFA, where uh, over 40 children, school children, here you'll see some of them were also adults, were um, killed in uh, while they were on a school school field trip uh, by an inaccurately targeted missile. But the, the the interesting thing is that when this happened, they were immediately vilified, and it was only and seen essentially that there was a target there and that there was a purpose um, for the Saudi coalition. Uh, that had by which through which the United States had supplied these. Um, these weapons, um, which had initially actually started through Obama, unfortunately, and was the one of the only things that was carried on by Trump. And, um, and so initially it was actually seen as justified, but it was because of a camera, it was a phone camera that one of the children had whose father had given him for the day to record that the only garden that they could go to um, in the Hian was actually the cemetery because that was the only place that they could find any greenery. And so you see this and uh, in fact, you can still, I still look for it sometimes and you can still find it online where people, where the children are playing and having a good time. And so it proved that it was actually just a field trip. Unfortunately, and horrifically for the children who maybe were a little bit um, naughty or didn't make it to the field trip the next day actually buried their brothers and um, classmates. And so these images were really, they, you know, while they weren't, while they didn't spread, that it, it kind of, it made me think about the censorship. And so I was initially finding these images through Twitter feeds, through, you know, by Yemenis who were actually bearing witness to that. And I felt it was really important to somehow communicate this in a way without, again, beautifying it. And so after collecting and compiling all of this data and information, which essentially turned into a web in my studio, um, I compiled it into a binder. And this binder, I didn't quite want to make it into 500 pages. So it was 498 and I started the next binder after that. While I was, while this was exhibiting in Beirut, um, in fact, a German patron um, approached me and asked me to purchase this edition or this binder. And to kind of think that also this speaking as an artist, you know, I remember the curator at the time telling me, you know, well, it's an art, so it, of course it's for sale. And I said, well, that, that made me start thinking about what is it as an artist do, do, does it always mean that an artist and a citizen that we act as them at the same time? And I strongly believe otherwise that I can be a citizen separate from being an artist and, um, and I can be them also at the same time. And so in this, this is I think my research and my and producing this as a citizen. And of course I refused the purchase, um, but um, what, and I refused also to make other copies, but um, because it was, it's also about time and this urgency of needing to continue to compile more information. And this will continue going on until the war stops. Uh, but what I did do was I made a video and it's a 17 minute video, um, which is actually um, available right now. It was, uh, and it sort of compiles us in a more, um, uh, in a shorter version revealing not only the names and culprits, um, including as you can see here, the list of uh, senators who voted to keep um, 
continuing to produce and to provide military arms to the Saudis. Um, and for this reason, the reason that this was so important for me was that this whole project was really about naming, um, naming the five largest weapons manufacturing companies, Lockheed Martin, uh, Raytheon, Boeing, Bay Systems and General Dynamics who have participated in the massacre in Yemen, um, and also the list of countries. But here, particularly, I'm being critical of um, the country of my adopted land, which is the United States. Um, and so as we just came out of these, what to me at least would feel quite hopeful elections, I think it's just important to, to think even more at the urgency of what Georgia means right now in terms of these elections that are coming up and how the sway of the Senate in fact could mean the end of the war in Yemen. Um, and it just goes to make you think that uh, how, how important a vote is, um, a vote for a United States citizen is much more prominent and stronger than um, about the future for an individual Yemeni's life. And so vote. Um, and so throughout this, as it was also a really, it was still an art project in, in, in ways, and the only way that I could respond to it as well was in order to deal with, with this information constantly. Of course, it was a privileged position to be able to kind of turn off the Twitter or, you know, uh, move away from these images, many of Yemenis who were not who are not able to, all of my family that are there with the exception of my, my brother, uh, my family, my immediate family, my brother and my father. Um, but I think I had, to, I, I had to sort of respond in the best way that I knew in which it was as an artist. And so, and this was a series that create essentially punctuations throughout um, the, throughout the, the binder and it, it's the series under thread in which I actually unravel my um, this this thread um, around my face in which there's this sort of like a passport you know this image of what it is as a either as a passport or a mugshot um, there's a certain kind of confusion and obfuscation of understanding what is what are all these obfuscated or confusing information that we get from different factions and how we have to identify what is the truth and what is not. But also, um, and that's the attempt that I'm trying to do in this binder, um, but also what does it mean to, to actually, from all of my work from previous and where I'm like being covered or covering other, holding the power of not being seen in this case really, having the power of saying that I see you and I know that you are um, responsible for the death and the erasure and the eradication of one of the oldest civilizations, which ironically actually for the Arabs involved in this who are fighting it is that they're essentially committing cannibalism <laughs> because they are originally Yemeni. Um, and so I play that as well in parallel to my experience as a US citizen and also as a native Yemeni. And what does that mean in terms of eating myself as a taxpayer? Um, so this sort of, um, then it kind of led to this place of really not, not being able and not knowing where to go. Um, and I should say that the last film conflict is more profitable than peace can actually be viewed. I, I didn't want it. I wanted to make it as accessible as possible. It can be viewed on my website and it's also on a full stream for the whole year on the Benton Museum's website, which is, um, curated by Rebecca McGrew, um, who's actually with us today. And, um, and, it, and it will be streamed there throughout the year. Um, and so go, kind of what, what happens as well, you know, my work kind of leads from one to the other. What happens when we're sort of in this position of paralysis? Where do we go? And I was really, um, I was really moved by every single class, I should say, by one of my mentors, Colleen Smith, um, who really works around um, Afrofuturism. And futurism in general, I mean, I, kn I knew a little bit about it, but I was never really put, you know, kind of excited or maybe I was, I don't know, maybe I never kind of got, I was much more interested in sort of documentary and sort of real life situations, but I suddenly in the last two years had gotten incredibly excited about science fiction and the possibility of being able to talk about really different difficult topics um, through through symbolism. And I mean, I've always loved magical realism and we even ha we have it in our stories in Yemen, but 
what, you know, never really thought about it as like science fiction or futurism. It was so much about the past. And so going from these black and white um, images where rather than redacting the information, um, I'm highlighting the information. I wanted to do a switch and actually um, create a glitch in this. And uh, this is the beginning of the film Mahjar, which is about on migration. Um, it's a word that actually, if looked at the, in the, like, in, in the Arabic, um, uh, we work with roots. And so this can actually be many different things. Uh, Majad can mean colony, overseas, diaspora, migration. Um, and I thought it was a perfectly all encompassing uh, word. And so here, this I just wanted to show some stills and I hope that many of you were able to see the film. And if not, um, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, again, it's you can watch it actually um, on my website. I also chose to make this one accessible simply because of COVID and I didn't want to leave the last word on the sort of binder, on the binder and on conflict. I wanted to think about the future, as, um, the future as well and make a work that was for Yemenis particularly. Um, and so here we see the spider and this, the spider really plays a huge role as you can see in the last, in the last project, but also in this one, I start drawing on these myths um, in order to think about a radical future, if I were to think about the future as it would be set right now, the only future that I see would be dystopic, but it's not the future that we as Yemenis have set forth for ourselves. In fact, it's the future that we've lost we've lost control because of weapons manufacturing companies, because of these dominant sort of imperial and colonial powers, um, such as the United States, Saudi Arabia, and so and Britain actually, um, because they were colonized by the British. And so what happens when, you know, all of that erasure and trying to dig beyond that in order to get to what is the core and what are roots, and we come from an extremely rich, rich ancestral knowledge um, that that is not only in, in stories, but in the stars and, um, in ancient languages, uh, in powerful civilizations, one of which was um, this uh, was Sheba, otherwise known as Seba, Queen Belqis was the ruler, and many of you may not know it because uh, her name was also erased in the uh, texts, in the Jewish texts, in Christian texts, and in Muslim texts. And so um, she was a sun worshiper. And I don't know if you can see the double image here, but she is reflected here um, by a wonderful woman named Iman Ahmed, who worked with me and uh, on in terms of how we, we were essentially trying to find stories, something that didn't focus on politics or on religion. I did a research in both um, in uh, Detroit and in Brooklyn. And the one story that we all seem to know was the story about a Najm al-Ahmar and of course the spider. So I'll first of all, I'll tell you the story of the spider. Um, so it is believed that the prophet Muhammad um, was running away from people who were trying to capture him. And so he came across a cave and an angel tells him to hide in the cave, but he's worried that he'll be trapped. And so the angel insists. And when he hides in the cave, um, a spider weaves this web across the entrance of the cave. And so the three people who were pursuing him come after, and they realize that it was going to be impossible that he was inside this cave, otherwise the web would have been broken. And they're mesmerized by this web, and so they continue on. So essentially the spider uh, really protects not only the prophet, but I would argue the religion, and yet the spider is never seen as the protagonist of this story. However, in the future, you know, we're never, as Muslims, we're never allowed to kill a spider because a spider represents baraka, blessing. And um, so for me, I take the spider essentially as a time traveler and she travels through time back to the time of Belqis, the queen of Sheba, um, into 3000 years from today in where Yemenis actually live on Mars. Um, and so this is a section that um, perhaps we can talk about later that Awad talks about his story as he's leaving Yemen. And here he says, the soul knew that it entered a point of no return, the step of the unknown. And I thought it was quite beautiful to include here because anyone of the diaspora could certainly understand what it means to be disoriented um, and constantly being having to reorient themselves around a new space and a new time, even, even that understanding and meaning of going back home. In the film, I also um, 
Last year I visited the Met and so I include objects in which I saw at the Met that have been, that are in the collections of the British Museum and the Sackler um, collection, many of which are still perhaps unclear of what, whether or not they were looted. On the top, in fact, is Queen Belqis. And, um, and so I comment, it's a commentary that I make in terms of the fact that, and also in a book that um, the Benton Museum had published, I, I comment on this thinking about the fact that as Yemenis, our objects and our heritage are even things that we can no longer access, not only because we need visas to get into countries that we are banned from, unless we are citizens, because Yemenis are banned under the Trump um, Muslim ban, Brexit and so on, but we also have to pay these museums in order to have access to um, you know, these objects of our inheritance. Um, and so we can kind of talk more about this. And I think the last part that I'll probably talk about is this language um, that you see, and this is the red star. This is the exhibition that was curated by Rebecca McGrew with independent curator, Hannah Grossman. It's at the Benton Museum. It's open, it's the first, uh, one of the first exhibit, well, it is the first exhibition um, along with a few other artists um, for this new building. And um, so essentially that the story that we believe is that 3,000 years ago, uh, Queen Belqis was actually ruled Seba. Seba went over, um, it extended from what would be modern day Oman, Hadramaut, Yemen, and Ethiopia. It was an extremely powerful civilization. Uh, the Phoenicians and Romans didn't even conquer it, but in fact traded with her. And, um, and we were, were a very rich civilization. And because of that, because of the trade of frankincense and myrrh, actually a lot of artisans and uh, craftspeople and masters were, um, were commissioned to make many of the objects that some of which you actually see that I have just shown you at that are housed now at the British Museum, um, the MFA Houston and so on, um, and at the Smithsonian that were exhibited at the Met. And so I think about, so she, we also, there are these kind of other stories that she was part jinn, part sort of spirit. And sometimes that's seen also as a, as a negative trait, but I think it's quite amazing. Um, and so she could communicate with the, um, with the animals and she was started communicating with another wizard in the north, uh, otherwise known as King Solomon. And they communicated through the birds and King Solomon wanted to understand and try, wanted to see her and she accepted that he come to visit her. The other, as long as she, he brings her a size of her power. And so he did and he came and he gifted her the red star. Now, when I was telling the story and when we were talking about the story, Iman with Iman and Awad, I thought this was the sun and Iman thought it was Venus and Awad kind of figured it was this mythical place. But then when I dug deeper, I found that in 1997, three Yemenis, um, when, the, when NASA sent the first pathfinder, the Sojourner pathfinder to Mars, three Yemenis tried to sue NASA for invading our inherited land. And I found that this is quite interesting as a point of departure, especially in the time that we're talking about colonization and space colonization. And what does it mean not only to physically go and occupy and name Mars, Mars is in fact, in fact already entirely mapped out, um, but also what does it mean for not only Yemenis but other indigenous communities to, to have our myths and our dreams and our stories the star that essentially ties us, when we look at it, ties us to Belqis from 3,000 years ago and to people, um, our ancestors even into the future. I, wouldn't, I don't want to call them descendants because they continue to be our ancestors into the future. And I really wanted to somehow document this in a way and what better way to do it is than with language. And I started listening to the language considered a dead language, uh, which is ancient Sabaean. And when I listen to it, and if there are Yemenis, I think there are many Yemenis who are listening here today, I urge you to go online to listen to ancient Sabian and you'd be very surprised how much you understand. And I was really moved by that. And a friend of mine, Naama, who speaks Hebrew, could read a lot of it. And I couldn't read it because I don't read Hebrew. Um, although now I've been working on it and I think now I'm quite okay with it, but I've also been working on ancient Sabian. And I was quite moved at how much I understood, thinking that if I could understand something from 3,000 years ago, then perhaps I can ina imagine 
along with this radical future of living in a different place, um, perhaps as a star like Mars, um, what would the language be of the future? And so here, this is a letter from the future for Yemenis, um, also a mapping into this uh, right, these radical new potentialities. And it um, fuses together Arabic, Hebrew, and ancient Sabaean. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And um, I mean, I guess I'll say that there's also this sort of catalog, I think we'll talk about it after, but it's a way that really documents all of what I um, have worked on, all of what I've talked about, um, but we can talk about that in a little bit to give us some time to chat. Well, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, everyone tuning in, you could start uh, going to the Q&A section and asking uh, whatever you're curious about. Hopefully everyone was able to watch the film. If you haven't, I really recommend it. Um, it was so amazing. Um, you know, I had a question when I was watching it and you kind of touched on it a little bit. And um, I had the privilege of speaking to you before this about your film. And I didn't, I knew who the Queen of Sheba was you know, um, but I didn't know her name. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what do you think the importance is and what motivated you to name her in the film? I mean, I think it's, I, I think for me, growing up also in Yemen, you know, Belkis is such a normal, it's, it's a name. I mean, it's a name that people have. You also see it in restaurants, you know, like the Belkis. I mean, this is something that, I don't know how else to describe it. I guess like how here, maybe everybody talks about like, you know, Freedom Cafe or something. It's like we have both these everywhere, you know? And in fact, her throne is still, um, even her throne actually has not been destroyed, um, thankfully, is still in Ma'rib, Yemen. And so even the image of her throne is found also on everything, like on, you know, the airlines, <laughs> like Yemeni airlines, you see everything, you know, you see that. And, and so it was kind of strange for me when I also came to the States, there were a lot of things that really shifted, you know, for example, you know, again, kind of the, how precious the spider is, how precious snakes are, you know, my tribe is Hanesh, you know, so we are, we, it means that if there's a power and patience and snakes, how there were these shifts, but also in Belkis and then the, these namings. And, and I also kind of thought, because I also had a religious my, when my mother wanted to make sure that I went to a Yemeni school so that we can speak Arabic. And so part of the school, we also had religion class. And I think there was, I never really did because it was in Yemen that we knew these was, but really coming to the States and understanding that these women, women weren't named. And I did another project called Ismi, um, Call Me She, where I name several women who over the course of the books, I guess, the religious, you know, the holy books from, you know, the, you know, the Torah, the Old Testament, and then the New Testament and so the Quran. In fact, in the Quran, none of the women are named except for one woman and it's Maryam. And the only, only way that women are acknowledged are, it are either by where they're from or how do they serve this sort of protagonist figure of the man or of a prophet, of one of the prophets? And so that project was also a way for me to kind of reclaim and name them um, and bring them back. So, I mean, that's, if we're talking about the erasure of a land, then we're also talking an erasure of a matriarchy, which is for me much more interesting as knowing that is my, my heritage. Um, yeah, I hope that explains it. And I think, and, and I think for me, I'm sorry, I'll just say is that uh, again, like you said, you know, the queen of Sheba, I kind of, I, I would always sort of have to correct people because people would say Sheba because people would think that her name is Sheba and then maybe confuse it with Shiva, <laughs> like the Hindu God, you know, and you're, you're, uh, so yeah, I think language and naming is important. And hopefully after this, it's a way for people um, other than Yemenis to kind of know uh, know her name, but also for Yemenis to be reminded that we come from a matriarchy. A very important point. Um, I never realized in the U.S. how unknown Belkis was um, in that erasure, but like you were touching on how, how that's really not the case in Yemen, right? She's an important figure to us, and we really acknowledge the history and 
we're very proud of Belgies and we continue to be. Um, one of the other themes in the film is diaspora. And one of my favorite parts of the film in particular is there's an excerpt of someone describing the last moments that they were in Yemen. So I'm wondering if you could expand a bit on the story behind that. Yeah, um, actually, as you said that, uh, I, 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 got, I always kind of, I got goosebumps because I think it's something that I remember asking the question. So it was Awad Ghazali who's now living in Dearborn. Um, in fact, he just got his um, citizenship last, March, I believe, um, which is, uh, you know, ironic considering that March 19th marks the war in Yemen. And um, it wasn't last or the one before, it was last, it was this one. Um, and he ended up, um, he came from Yemen in 2000, like end of 2015, it was a few months, like kind of like eight months and he would, or no, 2016, because he had also been in Djibouti. He had quite a difficult way out. I think a lot of other people had a lot more difficult, especially as you come in. I mean, who's there to judge, but this was before things were blockaded in Yemen and blocked. And, um, and he'd come out and one of the questions that I asked him, which of course you sort of have to build this intimacy with someone. Um, and he, I'm so grateful that he trusted me to ask him, but I said, what was the last thing that you imagine that you remember of leaving Yemen? And he describes this, this experience, which is documented in the film. And I thought it was sort of powerful rather than showing his face again, it was showing it to the sky. Um, and he talks about, um, and he says it in Arabic. And so it's translated into English, basically, um, that it was the last light he gets onto this ship. And the, you know, as a ship disembarks, you know, slowly the lights start disappearing. He sees the final light in the port. And, you know, the fact that I'm thinking about futurism as well, and that even with him and this unknown, even of migrants and refugees right now, not really knowing the end point or the destination, not being able to really imagine their future on these horizontal, moving horizontally. Sometimes we find so much solace and so much comfort by imagining vertically, by looking at the sky, by imagining the possibility of the stars, by being on these maybe, you know, and these ships, right? What if they're starships, you know? And what if they're ships that, that help us time travel into a time when we were a stronger civilization, when we were the one, some, one of the strongest civilizations, into the possibility that if we can think about that in the past and we can imagine it into the future. So, um, yeah, and, I, and, I, and that one was, that, that's actually a real, and a lot of this, I mean, this was mostly, there was some support, but all of the stories come, came from um, stories and experiences of Yemenis of the diaspora. And that was a very powerful one. Yeah, I will say this and I'm gonna do a plug for him because he um, actually started this company called Aqiq, um, which means agate, which is another thing that Yemenis are really quite, it's called Aqiq, A-Q-E-E-K. And essentially um, they, um, him and his family kind of import different objects um, or food from Yemen um, or Yemeni foods. So halawa and um, which is like a certain sweet and even down to certain sem like ghee. So it's a nice and coffee. So it's a nice way, I think, yeah, to support him too. There is <clears throat> a question in the Q and A section from Aisha. Um, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but if you want to give any more context or if you have any more things to say about it, it seems like something people are interested in. Um, would you please explain the motivation of the lawsuit against NASA that you mentioned in your film? So you talk about you talked about how um, three Yemeni men sued NASA over uh, the what was it? You, you the. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay, I, is, I don't know if this is like Aisha Juman, but Salam alaikum khala. <laughs> okay, shukran um, al-su'al. And uh, I would, uh, yeah, so I found this really interesting. It was actually in the Yemen Times. I have the, I have it here. One second. We're gonna... 
So this was uh, in Yemen today, and this was actually, um, uh, I got this in 2008, it was the last time and somehow I kept it and I don't know why. This is also another sport that Yemenis have where you they're jumping across, um, across uh, camels. But here's the story and I thought that it was actually really beautiful. I might make it available online and um, about one of the gentlemen who kind of, who found this and who, you know, thinking about the story and you're right, I, I'm focusing on the word when you're saying motivation. So, you know, what does that mean? Is it so that these three Yemenis, and there was a lot of questions because the way that people had commented about it. So al um, CNN, BBC, The Guardian was really mocking about, uh, not al actually, which was a, an Arabic um, article, uh, but it was, I mean, an, an Arabic, um, speaking journal, but the others were so mocking, in fact, that they started commenting on how, oh, well, they didn't pay the taxes, and who are they to own Yemen, and who are these three tribesmen, and it was very, um, and that's actually in the magazine, I mean, in my film, and I, and I, and I, I saw the difference, and actually in the film, I put the Thodi article alongside the CNN one, and the CNN one is so short and mocking and the Thodi one is so long. And you can tell that unless you speak Arabic and English, you're really missing information, right? And you um, and and there's an access for people who do speak both languages um, and, or, and even more access for people who speak three languages, which is also the language of the future, which there's a sort of learning that you're tr that I'm trying to do through images. And I think that, you know, those same questions though, while the motivation can be like, okay, well maybe this star was inherited. Maybe it was so that they could have land and sell it themselves, you know, but, but all of it does seem so absurdly beautiful that what does it mean for them to say, no, what about, what about, you can't go into this without talking to us because this has been our, this has been in our history and our story, but who is NASA in this position to say your stories are not true? You know, whether your oral histories are true, they're not our, the way that we tell our stories because we come from sort of a white Western European way of narrating and writing history in a particular way to our agenda. And that's what's valid. Um, and so I, I almost see about this, like going back to when I was thinking about, when I was talking about borderland, about these sort of indigenous oral unity and like this and, and solidarity and these histories of how they're being documented in textiles versus the very literal way of writing it and, and then going and naming it. And right now, one of the projects that I'm working on is actually all planes and craters and um, different physical bodies on Mars. And it's fascinating to see what they're, who they're named after. Uh, there is one place of every country that is on there, but then so many of them are named after, you know, men and scientists. Well, who are these men and who are these scientists? And, you know, of course it doesn't, it isn't owned by NASA, but who gets to go there <laughs> and who gets, and right now nobody has you know, been, but, and they still weren't able to bring things back, but what happens when they start drilling? And that's a whole other conversation because Yemen would actually be one of the richest countries, but a lot of the oil is actually being pulled out. And, you know, Khala Aisha, like you'd probably know when I was growing up, I knew the US by Texas, Halliburton and Hunt. And as a child, I knew these company names, you know? Um, and so what does it mean even for, you know, extricating things from Yemen and then eventually now extricating things from Mars? I would like to think that, you know, there is greed. I mean, I'd like that there isn't greed and so on. So whatever these three Yemenis um, actually had initiated, but I would say that I think that they're heroes because they actually, it was this sort of David and Goliath you know, going to this sort of religious way that everyone can maybe understand where they are um, kind of standing up for all of us to kind of say, yeah, we actually have a place at the table. I love that. Yeah. It, and something I did notice in the film was really the difference between the Arabic translation, which did have the details and the context, whereas the English very short and mocking, right? Straight to the point. And without those details, um, you don't get the full story, right? 
Exactly. Um, and I think there's also a point of like holding that back from people, yeah. you know, but, but also knowing. So, you know, when you go through different processes of the film and I was really grateful during the process of making this film um, to also have a lot of people look at it beforehand. And when people would watch it, it was interesting because I'd get very different responses where they're like, well, I don't understand it and I need an explanation. I need it to be translated into English. Um, but a lot of brown people or people of the diaspora just were like, I know that I don't get it, but I get it. I get that this is not for me, but I also get that I don't get everything because I'm so, I'm constantly thinking about what I don't get and filling the gaps you know, filling the gaps of like what it means to, yeah. One of the inspirations for this film and you discussed it earlier was Afrofuturism. So we have a question on that from Mark, kind of discusses the connections between Yemen and the Horn of Africa. And okay. he's wondering, especially given that one of the textiles in your first work suggests a relationship with East Africa, to what degree is this relationship part of your work? Oh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, actually, I didn't show of any of the textiles that I showed, they were actually not of East Africa. Um, that was a textile that was from Nigeria, was from West Africa, but I'd actually it was sourced in Kenya. That's a whole other project. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you also talked about Afrofuturism because it um, that made, there was a sort of a break that happened in between making conflict is more profitable than peace and um, and Mahjar. Because I think, um, I, I mean, during the summer when I was kind of a little bit paralyzed by all of these images that I was seeing, um, you know, I started, you know, I was reading, you know, a lot of Afrofuturists watching them like Sunrock, Tavia Butler, also looking at Arab futurists. Um, Larissa Sansur, Mariam Benani, um, excuse me, Hisham Blasim, um, which is an excellent book, The Frankenstein of Baghdad. I think, and, uh, and I think, you know, there's also like the corpse exhibit. Anyway, there were a lot of really, there's a, I have a bibliography on my page on my website. So I would also, if people are interested in reading what kind of led up to that, that would be a good place. And I was working with um, African slash Dutch wax prints um, in a, a series called Flux. And that really also started from the idea, one of the fabrics that I showed you earlier, the Yemeni fabric is the sitara. And the sitara is actually also a wax print. It's a batik um, that initially came and the process came from the trade with Java, modern day Indonesia. Um, as I also mentioned, there are all of these symbols, there are these mappings that kind of identify everything, you know, the trade routes that Yemen at the time, you know, that we had in Hadram, you know, in Hadramaut, um, that we'd experienced, uh, and it was a way of documenting it. In terms of the West African textile that I showed, it was actually very violent um, because, in that regard, it was um, it was more about the Dutch along these same trade routes. The Dutch ended up uh, kind of creating this uh, mass-produced textile batik and tried to sell it back to the Javanese. The Javanese rejected it. And so they took it to a different part of their empire, um, which was to different countries in um, West Africa. So modern day, you know, it'd be like Togo, Benin, um, Ghana. And during this time, also in the 1930s, the Dutch actually copyrighted. So suddenly these, these symbols, this language, these motifs that didn't really belong to anyone because they belonged to everyone. They were a part of like what we in Arabic would call turath. They're a part of heritage, nobody owns it. Um, it was seen very similarly um, by these, you know, by different groups and communities there, but the Dutch actually ended up copywriting them and then utilizing them in these textiles, which they sold back to these communities. Now, um, What's interesting about that is that many, you know, fashion designers in the region actually cannot use some of those symbols, even though they're their heritage symbols, they can't use them anymore um, because of this copyright. So this project called Flux, which is actually also being shown at the Benton Museum and is also on my website, you can see, I, you know, they are this sort of explosion of color of like of saturated, um, they're really saturated images, but they also really talk about these sort of stories that are hidden in plain sight that we refuse to look at because of these colors. And they sort of hide these, you know, 
really problematic pasts. Um, and, and that sort of led one you know, into the other. But I, I really think that in terms of Yemen, one of the reasons that people may not understand why it's under, and its relationship, let's say, with East Africa, with Zanzibaris, like with, um, yes, yeah, so not only with the Horn, what would be modern day Kenya and Ethiopia and Djibouti, but also with Indonesia and even China, when we talk about Zheng He was who was a Muslim um, trader, um, ambassador, diplomat from China, um, from the Yunnan province, also with India, they'd traded all along and Yemen was a part of this really rich trade route. Um, and so, you know, when thinking about these other civilizations, Yemen also has a place at that table. And I would say, and I think it's kind of responsible to say, I also question how, um, you know, what, what, was, what, what did they also participate in, right? Which are not also all maybe positive, right? Thank you. Um, well, we have a couple minutes left here. So I kind of want to pivot to talk about your catalog, um, museums, how we experience art and, um, you know, artifacts have changed a lot in the past few months because of COVID. So can you talk to us a little bit about your catalog and I'll link it in the chat if anyone's interested in checking it out, um, why you made it, how you want people to experience it. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. And because I was looking through this, this is for Hala. Aisha, here's Planet Yemen. And this is one of the gentlemen, and this is the lawsuit that they tried out. So I will, I will send it to you because I do have your contact. Um, okay, so I would actually, um, I think that's really, I appreciate you asking that question in terms of what that means in terms of COVID. I am gonna share, um, I love you too, Hannah. Um, I'm going to share, uh, the, the screen one more time, because it was actually probably one of the most, I don't collaborate a lot, I have to say, but this was probably one of the most fruitful, incredible collaborations um, that I've done. Uh, and so this was produced by the Benton Museum, um, the same show that I'd mentioned with uh, Rebecca, um, who had curated it. And as you saw, there were like all of these layers that had happened before as in the buildup to this exhibition. And what was interesting is that because it was a two year research, um, this, since the exhibition only opened in October, it essentially opened sort of at the tail end of, you know, at the end of my, me graduating from Cal Arts. So a lot of the ideas were actually made in what Kimberly Varela, who is the designer and my writer in this is an incredible woman. Uh, we, she would describe it as these sort of uh, simultaneous structures. So while I was working on these films and the installations and the visuals, you know, and these, these, these ideas and these concepts, she was really working on the identity of how this would translate into a book. And so when we think about a book, a book is something that might go left or right or right or left, depending on what language and what orientation. And there were certain ideas that we talked about where I said, I really don't want it to go in one direction, I want it to go, I want it to be able to be accessible from different directions, not only linear in terms of left and right, but also up and down because we're talking about the vertical. And I'll just show you some images. So in it, there's also writings by um, the senior curator, Rebecca and Daphne Toussaint, the assistant curator and Michael Rakowitz, who is an incredible uh, artist and mentor um, who is Iraqi, um, US, um, he's Jewish and he considers himself an Arab um, Jew and his family has also been exiled from Iraq. And I think there are these sort of similar storylines that we work with, but it's a beautiful letter that he wrote to me. Um, and then my writing around the red star. And as you see, it goes down, um, you see certain images that are from the book that are things that I'd mentioned before that are essentially me reclaiming some of these objects um, by publishing them into this book from the museum. But you also see a lexicon and here you see in this brilliant way that Kimberly had mentioned where on one side you see it written in the correct direction for English and Arabic is in the opposite. And on the front side, actually Arabic is correct and all the English is in the opposite way. Um, so if you hold it up to the light, they actually align perfectly, 
which is really beautiful. Um, but one thing about this book is that it's not only a book, it is actually, it can open up into two books. Let me see. Um, so maybe this is a better way of saying it. And it became and ended up becoming an exhibition space. So if you see it here, you can open it and you have on one side, uh, this is essentially the fabric of the language of the future that's in holographic. But also if you open it, it becomes two books. So you have on one side, you have the binder, um, which is essentially the appendix, like the research, where you have all this information naming um, the culprits and naming the, um, the victims. And on the other side, which is very linear, and on the other side, you see these the, the, the stories and the explosion of colors that are really layered, you know, more vertically. And I think what was what really became important about this, and I thought that was beautifully designed by her, um, was that this is exactly what is a sort of the story of the diaspora is that it's always existing under these two um, constant realities that are happening. You know, it's the this this re, this dystopic reality. And then this reality of this imagined future, but also nostalgic past that we that we hold on to. Um, and so, yes. So there we go. That's the book. And if you're interested, it's also on my website. Um, you can get signed copies from my website, but you can also get them directly from the Benton um, website. So there you go. Well, thank you so much to everyone who tuned in on YouTube or Zoom, wherever you are. Remember to follow Aylia on Instagram, check out her website. Thank you for all your thoughtful questions. Our next events are going to take place in January. So subscribe to Code Pink's YouTube channel and they'll be up there. Um, and go check out all of Aylia's wonderful art. And thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us. Oh, thank you so much for organizing this. I find it so important, especially from what I started, just for people to understand what's at stake um, and, um, and who we are. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, so much. Thank you for attending everyone. Have a great night, everyone.